have you guys with us today. Uh, we're in a series called Practices of the Kingdom. Um, we are close to wrapping up this series, okay? So I'm, I'm sure some of you are very excited to see it go. Um, next week, I do want to let you know, Jared Thompson is going to be sharing the message with us. So if you don't know Jared, uh, Jared's a guy who, when he talks, you, you want to listen because he's going to speak some wisdom. But he's done some shorter teachings here. He did an amazing communion teaching a while back, but this is going to be his first kind of like sermon. So I'm excited for next week. Uh, but today, we're diving into the spiritual practice of meditation. Meditation. So I know some of you are already thinking like, great, another thing, another thing to add to my already long list of spiritual to-dos. Uh, but here's the good news. All these practices we've been talking about are really designed to work together, to kind of support and enrich each other. So, so if you think about, like, we talked about simplicity, right? Simplicity. Uh, the spiritual practice of simplicity allows us to kind of make space in our lives to observe Sabbath, uh, where we're kind of stepping away from the hectic routines and the clutters of our, clutter of our lives. And then on Sabbath, we can make space for silence and solitude. And silence and solitude are environments where deep prayer and meditation can flourish. They work, all these work best together. So the, rather than kind of seeing these practices as separate tasks to kind of check off lists, think of them as like ingredients. The ingredients are distinct, but when you mix them together, they create something whole. Um, our spiritual practices are like that. Individually, they're powerful, but together they can create a rich spiritual life. Um, so I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by what we've been talking about. Instead, I hope you see this really as an invitation to a more integrated, fulfilling spiritual journey. Each practice supports the other, and together they bring us closer to the heart of God. All right, so today we're going to talk about meditation. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. I need a little participation right here at the start, and you're going to have to be really honest, okay? Okay? How many of you would say that you occasionally make decisions or do things that make no sense or are sometimes irrational? Raise your hand. All right. Good, good, good. Rest of you perfect people. Um, you can just sit there and tune your harps or whatever you want to do there. That's good. Polish your halo. That's very honest of you. I, too, can make incredibly irrational decisions. So maybe you can relate. Sometimes you make up your mind, like, I'm going to eat good. I'm going to eat healthy. And you do for, like, two days straight. And then somebody brings donuts to work. And you say, I'll just, I'll just have one bite. Right? Which is an irrational thought in and of itself. Nobody eats one bite of a donut. And then you go, well, I've ruined my diet for today, so this will be a, a cheat day. Right? I'll just finish this donut off and get back to eating healthy tomorrow. And then at the end of the day, you've eaten all 12 donuts and a cinnamon roll to make sure you've kind of gotten your money's worth out of that cheat day. Right? Why do we do that? Or whatever it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wise financially. We're going to get out of debt. And for 11 straight days, you're making good decisions. Something breaks in your house. You freak out. So to soothe your pain, you go to Target and buy two pairs of shoes and an outfit to match, right? Why is it that we do this? Why is it that so many times when we, we know we should apologize, we don't? Or we know we should take responsibility, we do the opposite. When we know what's right, we oftentimes do what's easy, why is it that we often make irrational decisions? It's because our wires can get crossed up a little bit. So when I was just a, just a lad, we had this red Volkswagen Jetta. And this was before Jettas were like, cool. This was back when Jettas were like utility vehicles. Um, they used to have very vinyl seats. So weeks like this where it was very hot, it was a very painful car when you wore shorts. Your legs would like melt into the vinyl. Anyway... We had some work done on this car, and when we got it back, every time we turned left, the horn would beep. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. So driving through town, you make a left turn, the, the car's beeping. Everybody's looking, uh, you know, as a shy kid, so I just wanted to, like, shrink, right? It was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Um, my mom would just wave. She'd wave at the people, <laughs> which made it worse. Um, but why did the car beep when we turned left? There were some wires crossed. And sometimes as human beings on planet Earth, we can get our, some wires crossed in our minds. There is this thing called neuroplasticity. We've talked about this before. But what that means is your brain's not static. 
Your brain actually grows and evolves kind of like a computer that's programming itself. So every time you think a thought, it becomes easier to think that thought again. Literally, your brain is creating neural pathways, parts of the brain that fire together, wire together, which means a thought creates a pathway which makes it easier then to think that thought again, which is good news if you're thinking good thoughts. The problem is we often aren't. All through life, your thoughts are programming your brain. So if a baby smiles and the mama smiles back, the baby's brain says smiling is good, that is true, and a good pathway is formed. Uh, if a baby touches something hot, ow, hot, the brain creates a good pathway that says hot is bad. Don't touch the things that are hot. If a baby wants candy and the dad says no candy, and the baby's like, I want candy, and the daddy says no candy, and the baby cries and the dad gives the baby candy, the baby's brain makes a connection that crying gets you what you want, right? Our brain is constantly changing, creating, creating neural pathways. It's good news when you think good, true thoughts. It's bad news when you believe lies because your brain basically doubles down and tends to believe the lies more fiercely. And the thing is, many of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. Like the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 10.3. He said that for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with, those of you who are followers of Christ, our weapons are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? It's a wrong thought pattern. Uh, the connotation of what Paul means when he says stronghold is that of a, a prisoner locked in a prison of deception who has believed lies that have put them in this, this stronghold, this prison. God's power demolishes strongholds. That is why we demolish, we crush, we vanquish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. The way the Apostle Paul fought and won the battle of his mind inspires me. So writing from a a Roman prison, when he wanted to be preaching in Rome, locked up, he wrote this powerful, encouraging letter to the believers of Philippi. And he ends this letter with a word of encouragement. He doesn't say, "Uh, I'm so discouraged, will you pray for me? I'm hurting, things are bad, I never thought this would happen, where's God? At the end of the letter, he says... One more thing. Don't forget this. He says, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, here's what I want you to do. Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul's saying, if there's one more thing I can tell you, don't forget this. Of everything that we've covered, of everything we've talked about, I want you to remember this. Fix your thoughts on God's truth. I love the way the New King James Version translates the end of the verse. It says this, If there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Why? Why does it matter? Because your thoughts are shaping you. If you cannot control what you think, you will never control what you do. So we have to train our minds. So how do we train our minds? It's similar to training your body. So if I go to the gym and lift weights... Or if you go to the gym, lift weights, you're you're training your body. Uh, If I'm working on my mind, I'm training my mind toward truth. But here's the thing. If I just go to the gym and kind of work hard, throw some weight around and grunt, uh, does that mean I'll automatically be healthy? No, right? To be physically healthy, it's not just about what I do with my body. It's about what I put into my body. To be truly, truly be healthy, what, what goes in has to be healthy, not just what I do with it. The same is true with your mind. To truly have a healthy mind, it's not just about what you do with it, but it's also about what you put in it. So what I've been doing is I've been working on focusing my mind and training it toward truth. Training my mind by meditating on God's truth. Uh, Some people may say, you know what, meditation, does that mean you're new age, you're one with the universe, you're chanting, you're saying om, that kind of stuff? So no, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, The Bible talks about meditation all over the place. All through the Psalms, Joshua talks about meditation. It's all over the place. Yet in our culture now, when you hear the word meditation, you probably think of like transcendental meditation, Eastern meditation. That's not the same thing as biblical meditation. They're almost completely opposites. 
So with Eastern meditation, the idea is to empty the mind of thoughts, right? Empty the mind of logic, empty the mind of reason, to unfocus the mind. Christian meditation is a focusing of one's thoughts. Here's why this is important. See, when you study the Bible, when you read the Bible, what you're doing there, basically, it's basically something that's kind of cognitive, right? You're learning what truth is. When you study, the object is the scripture. When you pray, the object is God. You're talking to God. You're telling him what you need. You're telling him who he is. You're telling him about things. But the object of meditation is actually not the Bible, and it isn't God. It's you. It's taking what you just learned cognitively and working it into your mind and your heart. So some of the most famous psalms are actually not prayers, but meditations. So Psalm 103, 1 and 2 says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who's being addressed there? Who's the psalmist talking to? Himself, right? The essence of meditation is taking something that you know cognitively and saying, I'm going to flesh it out. What does this truth really mean? I'm going to think about the implications of for how I live my life. Here are the applications for for how I live my life in my family. Here are the implications for how this information works out in my job. A great way to meditate is with questions. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, he he had meditation questions. They were very, very simple. Luther would write down what the Bible verse says he was studying. Then he would ask three questions. He would say, how does this truth lead me to praise God? Secondly, what sins do I need to confess in light of this truth? Thirdly, what do I need to ask God for in light of this truth? So if the truth is, uh, God's not just a king, but he's a father, if that's what the text says, Luther would say, he would say, okay, why, why is it great that he's a father? This is meditation. He would come up with like 10 reasons why God is a father and not just a king or a shepherd or something else. And he would say, here are the 10 reasons I think it's wonderful that you're a father. And he would praise God for them. That's meditation. He would think them out. And then secondly, he would say, okay, now and what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what am I forgetting that, that he's a father in, in the ways that I live my life? Like, how is this affecting my life in the ways that I forget that he's a father? Then he'd repent of those. And then he'd say, what do I need to ask God for in light of this? It's meditation. It's focusing your thoughts on the word of God. Now, maybe that's, that's your approach. Another approach is people ask questions. Like this. You take a truth you just read, and you say, if I really, really believed that from the bottom of my being, how would it change the way in which I relate to my family? How would it change the way in which I relate to my work? If I really believed I was redeemed, if I really believed that I was loved, if I really believed that God will never leave me or forsake me, how would it change my life? Application kind of questions starts to create and strengthen the neural pathways of God's truth. It's focusing on God's truth. So why should we do this? Because I don't know about you, um, but when my mind is not focused, it doesn't typically drift towards truth. It typically drifts towards lies, right? Also, if I'm not focused, when I try to pray, I'm a very ADD prayer. Um, I don't know if any of you can relate. Oh, man, I have good intentions. Dear God in heaven, I love you. Today I worship you. And oh, my gosh, I forgot to change the oil. You know? I forgot to send that text. I'm like, oh, man, my prayer might last for like 32 seconds. And I wonder, like, what just happened? Did I pray? What? Meditation is training my mind to focus on God's truth. And it will make your prayer life better. Meditating on truth is taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. In Romans, Paul talks about Abraham and the fact that God came to Abraham and he told him when he was, he was wife were very old that he had to basically stick around and wait until Sarah had a son. God was asking for Abraham to base his whole life on the fulfillment of a promise that seemed very unlikely. Uh, what does Paul say Abraham did in Romans 4.20? It says, Being persuaded that God had the power to do what he said, he gave glory to God and wavered not at the promise. So I love that. He said, it says he started with informational knowledge. He knew God has this power. 
But then he was persuaded that God had the power to do what he said. Abraham starts with knowledge. It's informational knowledge. And then he works it in. He meditated on the information and was persuaded. So when this promise came that seemed like a long shot, Abraham didn't waver. Eastern meditation, it's passive. The whole idea behind transcendental meditation is to empty your mind and stop fighting. The whole idea of Christian meditation is to fill your mind and fight the truth in. Transcendental meditation assumes the best thing for you is to empty your mind. Christian meditation says, oh no, that's the, that's the problem. Your head's empty. You need to fill it with truth. Because if you can change your thinking, you can truly change your life. Your thoughts matter so much. So a couple questions. You with me? All right. A couple questions. So what stronghold is holding you back? Like at what point are you a hostage to a wrong mindset? So a couple possible examples. You aren't, you're, you're not good enough. After what you did, God can never use you. Um, you're always going to struggle financially. Everybody in your family does. You're never going to get ahead. Uh, you're never going to be a blessing to any, anybody. Relationally, you're a mess. You can never have true intimacy. You can never be close to anybody because you always screw up relationships. Everybody in your family battles with weight. You're going to always battle with weight. Um, identify whatever that lie is that holds you hostage. What is a stronghold that holds you back? Then what I want you to do is identify the truth. What truth demolishes that stronghold? Name it. Write it down. The truth, whatever it is. I am not what I buy or what I have. You know, I'm not a hostage. I'm not a prisoner to, this, to an addiction. I have the power of Christ dwelling within me, and I can overcome that thing that has haunted me. God is for me. God is my great provider. He will meet all my needs. I will be a blessing to others. Whatever it is, and name that truth. Identify what that lie is. Then identify the truth. And then sometime this week, find some scriptures that support that truth. And write them down. Write them out. Meditate on them. Focus your thoughts on the truth of God's word until you believe it. Write it, think it, meditate on the truth until you're persuaded. New neural pathways, the power of God, God's word renewing your mind. So you don't react to the lies that have held you hostage from the past, but you respond with truth. Write it, think it, meditate on the truth, believe it. And maybe you're saying, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know what the lie is I'm believing. That's why I keep giving examples. So some more examples. Maybe you're a hostage to your fears. You lay awake at night, wondering, worrying. Here's your meditation. Because of Christ, I am not anxious about anything. First Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I have the peace of God dwelling in my heart and ruling my mind. Write it, think it, meditate on it until you believe it. Maybe you say, I don't know what to do. I can't make a decision. I don't know what God's will is. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. So you meditate on, my, my life belongs to God. Daily I seek him and daily he directs my steps. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Maybe you lack confidence. Never, never good enough. I never measure up. I never can make a difference. You declare it and you meditate on the truth. My confidence is in Christ and Christ alone. Because his spirit lives in me, I can do everything he calls me to do. Second Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And you might feel kind of foolish at first, right? You might be saying things you want to believe, but your life says something different. But keep going. It's a practice. It takes time. A few minutes every day, sparking the brain that God so intricately created you with. New pathways of truth. Truth, truth, truth. Write it, think it, meditate on it until you believe it. And then one day it will start to click. It will be truth. Kind of two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, two steps back kind of thing. God is renewing your mind. And then one day it will click. And instead of reacting with a lie that has held you hostage for years or even decades, instead... You respond with truth. I'm going to be real honest with you. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I meditate on. And the reason I meditate on this truth is because it's, it's counteracting the lies that I battle with. So for years I battled with the lie that you're not good enough. No one wants to hear what you have to say. You're inadequate. You don't have what it takes. 
So here's what I battle with. I, I battle with putting God first because I'm so consumed with living up to others' expectations. The, the pressure to accurately communicate God's truth in a way that engages people is a weight that I feel every single day of my life. The, the weight of being a leader in a church that God's blessing and staying submitted to his spirit and getting it right and dealing with all the complexities of it is a burden that never, ever goes away. So what do I do? I take in God's word every day. I focus, I meditate on the truth of God. I declare some truths about me from God's word. And I pray for those around me, which takes my mind off me, which is, what I, um, which is super good. So this is what I declare about me. So every day I say this or something very similar to this. I say, Jesus is first in my life. I exist to serve and glorify him. I love my wife and children, and I will lay down my life and serve them. Uh, I love people and believe the best about others. Christ in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. I'm growing closer to Jesus every day. Because of Christ, my family is closer. My body is stronger. My faith is deeper. My leadership is sharper. The world will be different and better because I serve Jesus today. I always end with that. The world will be different and better because I serve Jesus today. Why do I say this? Why do I meditate on this? Because what you believe matters. What comes into your mind comes out of your life. So to finish up, um, we're going to focus our thoughts on truth for a bit. Okay, We're going to take about four minutes, four and a half minutes, and meditate on truth today. And the truth we're going to meditate on is that God cares for us. So we're going to play a video up here with some scripture on it. Uh, it's about four minutes long. I just want us to kind of focus our thoughts on the scriptures that you see. Try not to let your mind wander. Meditate on what the scriptures are saying about God and how he thinks about you, okay? When the video is over, I will pray.
Help us to focus our minds, to meditate on you, your power, your goodness, your kingdom, your glory, your truth, your word. Help us to renew our minds, God. Help us not to react with a lie, but God, help us to respond because your truth dwells in us. Lord, we know that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. You are our helper. We will not be afraid. We are not slaves to our habits. We are not prisoners to an addiction. We are empowered. We are called. We are chosen. We are the masterpiece of God created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You are for us. You are with us. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not angels, not demons, not the present nor the past. Nothing will separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, If the ministry team wants to come up front, come get prayed for. If you have anything you'd like prayed for. Uh, You who are, you are who God says you are. Declare the truth and walk in it. Amen? Amen. Free to go, free to come get prayed for if you'd like.